Hello and welcome to another teaching from 119 Ministries. Our ministry believes that the whole Bible is true and applicable to our lives today. If you would like to learn more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button below. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. What is the Feast of Sukkot or Tabernacles? What does this feast mean and how is it relevant to believers today? Well, Sukkot is one of Yahweh's Moedim, one of his holy days. Before we get into the specifics of Sukkot, it is worth giving an overview of all of Yahweh's Moedim. We simply want to give a better understanding to these important days in the eyes of Yahweh. Quite often, we receive questions asking about the Moedim, Yahweh's holy days. What are the Moedim and what is their point? While there are many opinions held concerning the Holy Days, we want to do our best in giving a general overview to them. Many have looked at these days as just for the Jews. However, we also know the commandments surrounding the Holy Days are given to all who choose to follow Yahweh regardless of whether they are native-born Israelite or simply grafted in through faith. Deuteronomy chapter 31 Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns that they may hear and learn to fear Yahweh your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law. The Moedim are given to the native-born and the sojourner alike. Because many do not understand that Yahweh gave his holy days to all in the faith, many in mainstream Christianity today do not keep the Moedim festivals. Sadly, the same also do not understand that the substance of these holy days are all about teaching us about the Messiah. Colossians chapter 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. This teaching in particular will teach how to observe Sukkot and some of the exciting messianic prophecy attached to this feast. In review, there are eight Moedim, or appointed times. The first of the Moedim is the Sabbath, in which a rest occurs every seven days. The rest of the Moedim are annual observations, which are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Shavuot, or Pentecost, Yom Teruah, or Trumpets, Yom Kippur, or Atonement, and Sukkot, or Tabernacles. Three of these Moedim are specifically called feasts, meaning they are Moedim that involve feasting. Those are Unleavened Bread, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Sukkot, also known as Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, is the last and final annual feast and is the focus of this teaching. Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 43. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, and for seven days, is the Feast of Booths to Yahweh. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You should not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to Yahweh. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to Yahweh. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation, for presenting to Yahweh food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day, besides Yahweh's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your freewill offerings, which you give to Yahweh. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of Yahweh seven days. 
On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. From this, we learn that Sukkot begins on the 15th day of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. It lasts for seven days, and then there's a set-apart bonus day called the eighth day. Both the first and eighth day are considered rest days. So this is the seventh annual Moedim occurring for seven days in the seventh month. The extra eighth day is sometimes referred to as the last great day. This day is very interesting prophetically, and we'll discuss that in the prophecy section of this teaching. During the seven-day period, all native-born Israelites are instructed to dwell in booths, or temporary dwellings. Sometimes the mention of native-born Israelites in Leviticus 23 verse 42 confuses people, as if all the other Moedim are for everyone, except for Sukkot is only for native Israelites. Remember, in the faith, All are treated as native Israelites. Many are grafted in and are treated just the same. Even the grafted in are the same as native-born before Yahweh. For more on this, please see our teaching, Grafted In. Deuteronomy 31 Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear Yahweh your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law. If the mention of native-born Israelites still compels you to believe that Sukkot might not be for all in the faith, we will mention one more point at the end of this teaching. Also, on the first day of this feast, we are to take the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God seven days. Many times these items are attached to a sukkah, which is the singular form of the Hebrew word for Sukkot. In observation of the feast, not everyone lives in a sukkah for seven days. In a literal sense, a sukkah is simply a temporary hut or dwelling. A sukkah traditionally has no roof or shielding from cold weather or rain. While a sukkah works well for a dry and warm climate like Jerusalem, many utilize tents or other temporary dwellings during this time outside of Jerusalem. Deuteronomy's account of sukkah specifically mentions that we should rejoice or be joyful during this time. Yahweh is literally commanding us to be joyful. Deuteronomy 16, verses 13-17 through 17. You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to Yahweh your God at the place that Yahweh will choose, because Yahweh your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year all your males shall appear before Yahweh your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before Yahweh empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of Yahweh your God that he has given you. You may have also noticed that this feast, like the other two feasts, are to occur in Jerusalem and involve the temple, which is the place that Yahweh put his name. Of course, there exists no temple today, so we cannot come before Yahweh with gifts. As a result, many memorialize this feast by doing it the best they are able, absent from being able to go before Yahweh at the temple. And of course, finally, this feast is about feasting. Eight days of eating, in fact. At this time, in Jerusalem, the harvest was coming to a close. This feast is an agricultural feast, taking advantage of all the food Yahweh has blessed us with during the harvest. This also has a prophetic significance that we'll discuss later in the teaching. Sukkot is often the favorite of all the feasts. It's a time of focused fellowship with Yahweh and all those in the faith, celebrating with worship, food, and all sorts of traditions. Sometimes Sukkot is observed in the backyard. 
Other times, hundreds of families may Sukkot together for one large, amazing event. However you do it, it always proves to be a blessed and joyful time. The Meaning of Sukkot and Prophecy The first time Sukkot is mentioned in Scripture is found in Genesis. Genesis 33, verse 17. But Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. After bowing seven times in verse 3 and leaving Esau behind in verse 17, Jacob arrives to a place he names Sukkot. The mention of a seven is connected with Sukkot. One of the things that Yahweh mentions as the purpose of Sukkot is to remind us when Israel dwelt in booths after coming out of Egypt. Leviticus 23. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. Which is interesting because the first place they stop is at Sukkot. Exodus 12, verse 37. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. So when we dwell in booths for Sukkot, we are to be reminded of the wilderness when Yahweh took his people out of Egypt and brought them into temporary dwellings in the wilderness. Sukkot is mentioned by our Messiah Yeshua as well, John chapter 7. On the last day of the feast, the great day, meaning the eighth day, Yeshua stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Yeshua may have been giving more understanding of Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. But here is what is really interesting. Specifically on the eighth day, Yeshua mentions living waters. This commands attention to the new Jerusalem, Zechariah 14. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. In the context of the New Jerusalem, we also read Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and the night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Many believe the new Jerusalem will arrive after Yeshua reigns for 1,000 years. Following this story of creation, there are six days, and the seventh day is a day of rest. There is a biblical principle that uses the days of creation, each day is 1,000 years. That is, there will be 6,000 years of man. Then on the seventh day, Yeshua arrives and we rest and reign with him for 1,000 years, or one day, specifically the Sabbath day. After the seventh day, technically the eighth day, the new Jerusalem will arrive. For more on this, we would recommend the teachings, the creation prophecy, the fourth and seventh day, and Hebrews 4 in his rest now or later. Meaning this, it was not likely an accident that Yeshua mentioned the living waters on the eighth day of Sukkot, as we are presented with the living waters from the New Jerusalem on the eighth day. This is why the Feast of Sukkot groups the seven days together, and then mentions another eighth day as separate from the initial seven days. In addition, the new Jerusalem arrives after the old earth and old heaven pass away, and we are presented with a new heaven and a new earth. Thus, Sukkot also reminds us that this life and this earth is temporary. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know if the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It should also be noted that all harvest will have occurred by then. 
the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and the grape harvest. That is the purpose of Sukkot, to feast on the completed harvest. There is a prophetic implication to consider here as well. Yeshua was referred to as the first fruits of the harvest, which is the barley harvest, 1 Corinthians 15.20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. There is also the wheat harvest, Matthew chapter 13. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plant came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew 13, verses 36-43 through 43. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The grape harvest are the rebellious. Revelation 14 Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. And blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Sukkot follows the completion of all harvest. And it is also a feast of the harvest. Often it is proposed that Sukkot will be the timing of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 verses 6 through 9. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready, and it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. So the reason that the marriage supper of the Lamb is speculated to be at Sukkot is because all the harvests have been completed and it is also found to be the last and final feast. Another interesting connection is found in the timeline of the first temple dedication. The temple was dedicated on the eighth day of Sukkot, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. At that time, Solomon held the feast for seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great assembly, from Lebo Hamath to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly, for they had kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. On the twenty-third day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their homes, joyful and glad of heart for the prosperity that Yahweh had granted to David and to Solomon and to Israel his people. Likewise, this appears similar to the New Jerusalem in which the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Revelation 21 And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Those are simply the prophetic highlights related to Sukkot. There exists hours of prophetic depth in the context of Sukkot. We simply wanted to offer you a start of Sukkot prophecy. One last thing to note. 
After the Great Tribulation ends, the Antichrist is defeated and we enter into the 1,000 year reigning with the Messiah Yeshua. Guess what? All nations will be observing Sukkot. Zechariah chapter 14. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with which Yahweh afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. This helps to prove two things. Number one, the holy days found in Leviticus 23 are not abolished like many Christians teach. And number two, it is not just the native-born Israelites that are to observe Sukkot. If you do not already observe Sukkot, consider and understand that Yahweh gave us these days for a reason. To teach us about our Messiah, to spend time in worship of Yahweh, to get away from daily life and instead spend time with our family and those in the faith. We hope that this teaching has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. It is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.